got in these next few moments together, we just want to invite you to do what only you can do, which is to speak to us. Now, God, you know that I've prepared thoughts and plans, but really all of it falls flat unless you're the one speaking. So God, silence my voice and may your words resound in all of our souls. God, cause us to dream bigger, to see what life could be like if fully lived and trusted in you. We love you, God, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And God, the Cowboys kick off at like 8.30 tonight. Help them to destroy the Minnesota Vikings. We just believe that together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That counts. I don't care. Let's get to work, everybody. Let's go. Hey, yesterday, I had a moment as a husband that might go down in the Hall of Fame of all husbands. Now, I've, I've done a lot of good as a husband. I try to bless my wife and meet her needs and take care of her and, and go over and above to spoil her. <clears throat> yesterday, though, Yesterday, I had a fun moment as, as her husband where I scored possibly more points in one moment than I've ever scored in my entire life. Now, for the last like three months, there has been rumor that in my garage, there lived a cockroach that was at least three inches long. Every time I talked to my family, they kept telling me it was longer and longer. At one point, I asked my kid, one of my kids, how big is it? And they were like, like this. And I'm like, what? Well, that's a pet. That's not a cockroach. What are you talking about? You know? And I kept, I kept going out and looking for it, and I couldn't find it. I could never find it. Like, it had gotten to the point where I was convinced that my kids were just lying to me to mess with me. That's what I thought was happening. But yesterday, my wife was about to head out for the evening, and she goes into the garage, and she screamed so loud. Now, every husband in the room knows that there's different kinds of screams that wives have. Can we be honest about this, right? There's that scream when they're watching the Hallmark movie, and the couple finally gets together, and they have that moment. There's the, ah, ah, there's that scream, right? My wife has a scream, and it's the scream every time I walk into a room. Now, it's not the kind of scream that I hope for. It's a scared scream. Like, I freak her out every time I come into the room. If I, if I try to, like, stomp my feet so she knows I'm coming, if I clear my throat on the way in, if I'm like, babe, hey, babe, baby, it doesn't really matter what I try to do. It always freaks her out, and whatever is in her hand becomes a weapon. Like, she could be eating a bowl of oatmeal, like, what? She'll pull her spoon out, and I'm like, Girl, what are you going to do with a spoon, right? But it's just, it's just how she rolls. But yesterday, she goes into the garage, and she let out this blood-curdling scream. I took off running down the stairs thinking, I'm going to fight to defend my wife's honor. And I said, what? And she goes, I saw it. I saw it. I was like, what? It? What is it? She goes, I saw that, that roach. I saw it. So instantly, I snapped into action because that's how I roll, boys. Like, we're the defenders of our ladies, right? I can't have a roach up in my business. I got to fight for this moment, fight for my wife. So I, I find whatever weapon I can find, which in that moment happened to be this trusty broom that I've had forever, and I go to battle. I pull one of the trash cans out, and I don't see it. I pull the other one out, and I see the back of one, and it just takes off scurrying, and I'm like, oh, prepare to meet your maker, Satan. That's what's about to happen, right? <laughs> so I pull this broom out, and then I rip a box away, and I see it, and it's this moment. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Even though I'm 194.95 pounds heavier than this roach, I was a little scared but I didn't let fear stop me. Fear establishes the boundaries of your freedom and I was created to destroy this roach in this moment. This was a big moment for me. And so I pull this broom out and I see it and I just smash it as hard as I possibly can with this. Now, to give you some context, my wife had gotten into her van and she had backed out of the driveway and she was sitting in her car watching all of this happen. Now, if I'm honest with you, I was a little scared in this moment, but I had to show that I was strong. I had to show that I could protect her. And so I start smashing the life out of this cockroach. My wife looks at me and I can't hear what she's saying because she's in her van, but I'm sure it's like words of adulation and praise and just love. I'm sure she's thinking about how she can't wait to hug me and thank me later. It's going to be an amazing moment. I'm proud in this moment. I'm killing this thing. And then, and then I took it a little too far. I decided to try to flex on her a little bit to show her that I was the man in this moment. Now, at this point, I thought the cockroach was dead. Um, I'm not actually sure you can ever kill a cockroach, to be honest, but, but I thought it was dead. And so I decided to not just kick it out of the garage, but instead I decided to not just sweep it out of the garage. I decided to hit it like a baseball out of the garage. And I had my broom in my hand. And I, I got her watching them. I got to show off for her. And I did what baseball players do when they're kind of cocky and they think they're going to hit a home run. And I just pointed out to the driveway. I took this broom and I reared back and I hit as hard as I could trying to knock the cockroach out. Inadvertently, what I did when I swung was I missed and I hit the ground. And the head of the broom broke and caught flights. 
And I'm not exaggerating when I say the broom head flew 15, 20 feet. And I had this moment of like my joy and my heroism turned into a moment of fear. And the broom head just kept flying and literally slammed into the side of my GMC Yukon. It left a dent in the side of my Yukon so big. I have literally already called last night. I was so mad about this. I've already started sending off emails for estimates. Some places are saying $500 to fix this. I walk over to the side of my car and I'm just like, I'm humiliated in this moment. I go up to Liz and Liz rolls down her window and she's kind of not trying to laugh at me in this moment, but she just looks at me and she just goes, she says two words. She goes, worth it. It's like, what are you, worth it? I just dinged my brand new car. What is wrong with you? Worth it. And she goes, we had to get rid of that thing. And I was like, okay, okay. And had this moment of realization in your life, there's just some things that it doesn't matter what it costs. You just got to get rid of it, right? Whether it's a cockroach in your garage or some stuff that has this tendency of getting lodged in your heart, there is just some stuff that it doesn't matter the cost. You just got to get rid of it. Last week, we started the series called Cold Turkey. We're talking about four things that we all need to quit. And last week, we started with talking about anger. And anger is something that has this way of lodging itself in our hearts. Many of us even defend how it got there instead of doing the hard work of getting rid of it. I said last week that anger has this way of being a carcinogen to our souls. If it goes untended, eventually it can become a cancer that destroys us from the inside out. So we said last week that we've got to figure out how to get rid of anger. And the, the antidote to anger is forgiveness. Forgiveness is not about getting even. Forgiveness is about your soul becoming free. So we said last week, we got to do whatever it takes to get rid of anger. Now this week, I want to talk to you about something that if I'm honest, I really struggle with. In fact, of all the topics in this series, I'm going to be honest, I'm not good at this one. I want to talk to you about two things. I want to talk to you about worry and hurry. I want to talk to you about the connection in the Bible between our worry and how we are trained as a culture to try to hurry everywhere. Now, one time Jesus was teaching, and this, this sermon that he's teaching is regarded as one of the most famous sermons ever. It is called the Sermon on the Mount. You can read it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in this sermon, Jesus talks about all kinds of random stuff. He talks about divorce and money and anxiety and worry and prayer. And he ties them all together in this beautiful way that helps this audience. And Jesus is preaching to them, and he, he says this thing in Matthew 6 that if you just read over it quickly, you miss one of the details, but it is fascinating to me how Jesus describes this. Jesus Jesus says, Matthew 6, verse 34, he's there, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus says, do not worry. And this word worry is this interesting word in Greek. Jesus says to this audience who is standing on the side of a mountain with the Sea of Galilee to their backs, he says to them, do not worry. Now, in Greek, this word worry is a fascinating word. The, the transliteration of the word is this word meris, M-E-R-I-S, which literally means to be split or fractured. It means to be split or fractured. So Jesus says to them, he says, therefore, do not be split. Do not live a compartmentalized life, but instead be fully present today. Essentially, what Jesus says is that worry is the failure to be here. Now, this is what he means. I don't know how you roll, but there are times in my life where I notice that I can physically be somewhere. My body is in a place, but my mind and my emotions and my heart, they're somewhere else. You ever, ever had this moment? You're physically somewhere, but emotionally, you're just checked out. You're somewhere else in that moment. I don't know if you've ever had this moment. Some years ago, my wife and I, we were celebrating our 10-year wedding anniversary. And we decided to take a dream vacation to Hawaii. Now, I had never been to Hawaii. I remember before I went to Hawaii, I was talking to my friends, and I was like, yeah, I'm excited, but the truth is, like, it's Hawaii. It's an island. It's going to have palm trees and beaches. We've got palm trees and beaches. People come from all over the world to Florida to vacation where there's palm trees and beaches. It'll be the same. I could not have been more wrong. We saved our frequent flyer miles, hopped on a plane, and we went to Hawaii, and it was this amazing place. There were mountains and beaches and drinks with umbrellas and coconuts. It was amazing. It was a beautiful, fantastic place to visit. And we were there enjoying this place. And on the third day, I had this weird moment with my wife. My, my wife, she, she turns around, and she stands face to face with me, and she puts her arms on my shoulders, and she goes, wait, hi. And I didn't know how to respond to that. So I just said, hi. And she goes, no, 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 no. Hi. And I said, hey, 
Hey, girl. Hey, what, what are you? Hey. And she goes, no, 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 no. Hi. She goes, you're, you're finally here. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She goes, you're finally here. And I said, what do you even mean? It was day three of a vacation. And she reminded me that even though I had been in Hawaii for three days, it's like I finally showed up. You see, to that point, I, I was so consumed with everything else going on that I hadn't fully arrived there on this vacation. You see, I pastor a church, and I love our church, and in that season of our church, it was so busy and growing, and, and we were busy. And on top of that, I have a company that I own that works with churches all over the country, and in that season, I didn't have anyone working with me, no employees on staff, and I'll never forget, like, I was working myself into oblivion in that season. I would work all day for the church, and then I'd come home and have dinner with my family. Then after dinner, I would sit down, and I would start working, and I would work until my side job work was done. Sometimes that was 10 o'clock, sometimes that was 2 a.m., sometimes that was an all-nighter. And there was a whole season of my life, legitimately, where I was working 120 hours every single week, like actually working 120 hours a week. I look back at the videos of my messages from that season and my face looked all puffy and gross. I was, I was probably clinically exhausted in this season. I, I, I got sick. I mean, it was just, it was a nightmare. And I finally get on a plane. I worked myself into complete exhaustion. I get on a plane. I land in Hawaii. And even though I was physically in Hawaii, in my mind and my heart was all the things still to do and all the emails that I needed to respond to and all the things that would not be done because I was in Hawaii that week. And then I had that moment of realization where reality smacked me in my face. And my wife said, hi, I wonder how many of us were so consumed by everything else in the world that we miss the beauty of this life that we were intended and created to live. In the book of James, the apostle James is writing, and he gives us this, this reminder that life is short, that life is here and then, and then it's gone. Look what James says in book, chapter four, verse 13. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make some money. He's like, those of you who are so consumed with all the busyness of life, he says, why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. Then he asked this profound question. What is your life? Something we should all come to terms with. What is your life even about? He says, you are a mist. We'll come back to that word in a moment. You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, he says, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. He's like, you're not even promised tomorrow, and yet you're so consumed by the potential of tomorrow that you have the potential to miss the beauty of today. And then he uses this beautiful picture. He says, your life is a mist. What is a mist? It's something that's here for a moment, and then it's gone. A mist comes, you can see it for a moment, and then it vanishes, and it is gone. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in the funeral of someone that you love, but if you've ever been to a funeral, you've experienced this before. When someone died, in your opinion, prematurely, and you're sitting looking at their casket, grieving the loss that you feel in your soul, you think to yourself in that moment, this life is short. I've got to make the most of this. I, I can't waste my time. And then what happens? We go back to work the next day, and life continues to go at a breakneck pace in a way that you'll never be able to keep up with. Your life is a mist. It's here for a moment and then it's gone. So we got to figure out if we're going to enjoy this life, if we're going to live a life to the fullest, then we have to figure out how do we, how do we do this? Now, if there's anyone who could get this right, it was this guy, Moses. Moses had this amazing encounter with God in Exodus chapter 20. Moses goes up onto a mountain and God literally gives him the 10 commandments. These are the new rules for humanity. And he gives them these 10 commandments. I mean, Moses has met with God. If anyone was close to God, it was your boy, Moses. Four chapters later, God says something to Moses that as we read it in the moment, you're going to skip right over it and you're going to miss it. But I want to point it out to you because even Moses struggled with this. Exodus 24 says, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain. And then I want you to highlight these two words and stay here. Come up on the mountain, stay here. And I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments that I have written for their instruction. So God says to Moses, I want you to come up on the mountain. Then I want you to be on the mountain. It's kind of weird, right? Come up on the mountain and be on the mountain. Now, the, the Hebrew phrase for this word, stay here, is a derivative of this interesting word. It's this word, haya, which is awesome to say. Haya. Haya literally translate means to be 
or to exist, to be or to exist. So God says to Moses, I want you to come up on the mountain and I want you to be on the mountain. Come up on the mountain and I want you to be on the mountain. Now, doesn't, doesn't that seem redundant? Like if you're coming up on the mountain, won't you be on the mountain? It's like what God understood about Moses is when Moses climbs to the top and gets to wherever the destination is, where does his mind immediately go? How do I get back down? How do I get back to where I started? And what God's saying to Moses is, I want you to get here, get to the mountaintop. But when you get there, I want you to be there. Don't be consumed by the next move. Don't be consumed by the next step you have to take. But just get here and actually be here. Some years ago, I had this weird encounter with my wife where she said, you know, uh, babe, all of our kids they, they never ask you for anything anymore. If they want something and we're both home, they both come to me. They all go to Liz. She's like, why, why do you think this is? And I thought about it and I realized that it is possible that as a dad in that season of my life, I was so consumed with everything else that there was to do that I wasn't actually being there with them. So what do you, what do you mean? It's like physically I'd come home from work, but my mind was still at work. My, my body was home, but my mind was preoccupied by the problems and the counseling and the situations that I dealt with in that day. And I was home, but I wasn't actually home. And so my kids probably had tried over and over and over to get through to me, but eventually it felt like hitting up their heads up against the wall. So they gave up and they went to Liz instead. And that moment of reality hit me. I can't miss this life when my mind and my heart is somewhere else. Let, do not worry, do not be split and fractured today, but be here. Now, why, why is it, do you think that we have this problem being present? Like actually being where we are. Why do you think this is a struggle? I, I would submit to you the reason is this, is we live lives that are so hurried. We live lives that are so busy, so consumed. You got to get from this place to this place. You got to get to soccer lessons and piano lessons and ballet lessons and back to violin lessons. Like life is just busy. You got to rush the kids around. You've got a job to do and you've got to get to the gym and you've got to do all these other errands throughout the week. Like we just live busy, consumed lives. And the problem is it has that potential to cause you while you're trying to live your life to actually miss your life. Some years ago, one of the most brilliant theological minds to ever live, this man named Dallas Willard, he said this about hurry. He said, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. Now, why do you think this is? I would submit that it's because you can't do anything that matters in a hurry. Say that again. You can't do anything that matters in a hurry. You can't slow dance with your wife in a hurry. You can't listen to someone whose heart is shattered into a million pieces in a hurry. You can't play Candyland on the floor with your daughter in a hurry. You can't love in a hurry. You can't listen in a hurry. You can't help in a hurry. And most importantly, you can't grow closer to God in a hurry. But we live hurried lives, don't we? Some years ago, I read a book by a man named John Ortberg, this brilliant pastor and author. And he was interviewing this man, Dallas Willard. And he said to Dallas, Dallas, hey, how do I, how do I grow in my relationship with God? Like, what's the most effective way to grow in a relationship with God? And here's what Dallas Willard said. He said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. John Ortberg said, cool, what's next? And then he responded, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. I read this and instantly I knew that I was struggling with what I would call hurry sickness. I had this disease of my soul because my whole life is in a hurry. Let's do a quick test and see maybe you struggle with this as well. Okay, let's play a game, okay? How many of you, if you were honest, if you were driving on a, a road that had two lanes going your direction and you came up to a stoplight, you would determine which lane you're going to get in based on the car in front of you. How many of you would do this, right? It's like if there's a Buick and a Corvette, which car are you getting behind? Come on, right? You understand, right? You're a little sick, a little sick. Let's go a little farther with this, okay? 
You go to the grocery store, right? And all the checkout lanes are completely full. Out of curiosity, how many of you do a quick scan of the lanes and you pick the lane based on which one you think is going to go the fastest? Anybody do this? All, you're sick. Okay, let's go even further. Let's go further with it. How many of you are sick enough to admit that you literally take note of the people who are in line at the same place as you to see if you actually got through faster or if they got through faster than you? Y'all need Jesus, okay, right? It's hurry sickness. We're just in a hurry. We gotta get places. We got things to do, people to see, stories to tell, laughs to encounter. We just have moments to live, but we're so in a hurry that I just wanna submit to you that I believe it's at the expense of so much else. Okay, think about the words that we associate with our food and speed. How many words do we associate with food and with speed? Here's a list of some that I came up with. We got fast food, we got an express lunch, Gogurt, it's yogurt on the go, right? <laughs> if you don't have time to eat in, in a restaurant, you could eat at a drive through right? You can get it to go. Food that's ready in minutes, we've got minute rice. And for those of you who are in such a hurry that you don't have a minute for your rice, we now have 59 second rice. But all these words, none of them speak to the quality of food. They're all about the speed of food. Why? Because we gotta hurry, we gotta power through, we got stuff to do, we gotta get through this. As you read scripture, meals are often sacred places places where people have encounters with God and with each other. Some of my most profound moments in childhood, they, they didn't center around watching TV. They were all around my dinner table, laughing till I was hurting. Like I loved those moments. I don't, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but have you ever, you ever had friends over or you've gone to a friend's house for dinner and you sit down at 6.30 for your meal and then you look at your watch and all of a sudden it's 9.30 and you've sat around, meal was done long ago, but you've just sat around talking and laughing and having so much fun and then you think you're gonna leave and you stand up to leave, but then you end up in the living room or in the kitchen talking for another 45 minutes or an hour. Why? Because there is something profound that happens in those moments. Why are we so hurried? Why are we so busy? Hey, here's another area that I think that we can find and try to eliminate hurry in our life. It's the area of our technology. Now, let me say this to you. I love technology. I do. I love buying whatever the latest and greatest gadget is. I enjoy it. It brings me joy. And what is the promise of technology? It'll make our lives faster. It'll make our lives more efficient. It'll bring us closer together, right? These are the promises. But does it actually, does it actually do that? Like, like I would actually argue that our technology does the opposite of all of its promises. But one of the things that technology does is it gives us this false sense of pride. It gives us this false sense of wisdom and knowledge, right? 20 years ago, if you were sitting at dinner with friends and you were like, who was the second baseman for the Oakland Athletics in the 1979 season? You'd have no idea, right? But now you can look it up in 10 seconds and you can find the answer, right? It's all at our fingertips. We have this inflated sense of knowledge that we don't actually have. Beyond that, the promise of technology is that it would connect us, that it actually brings us closer together. But I would argue how many meals, you go to a restaurant and you look around, how many meals do you see people sitting like this the whole meal? They're sitting next to someone, across the table from someone, but they're so consumed by this that they can't see the person in front of them. I read some time ago that in China, this has become such an epidemic that they're literally doing texting lanes on sidewalks. They were having issues with people so consumed with their phone that they were walking into people, walking into poles, or even worse, walking out into traffic. Someone in China thought, I got an idea. They created an app so that you can be texting or messaging with someone and your phone camera will pop open a screen so you can see what's in front of you on the screen. How sick is this? Some of you are like, hey, what's that app? That'll help me a lot, right? It's not the point. That's not the point at all. We just, we're so connected to this. Here's, here's where I realize it's getting me in trouble. I find myself on my phone and meals with my family, meals with my kids. I realized some time ago that when I sit down at a meal with someone in our church, I'll sit down for lunch and I sit down and I get comfortable and inevitably I take my phone and I put it on the table. What am I saying when I do that? You're important to me. But it is possible that someone is gonna message me and need me and it's gonna be more important than you. So this is here just so you know, right? Then my phone rings and what do I do? I have to determine, are you more important or are they more important? Some years ago I bought the Apple Watch thinking I'm gonna get healthy. It's gonna, it's gonna get me healthy, right? But it just became one more wall between me and people. You say, what, is it, what does it mean? Well now when someone texts me, it doesn't matter who I'm meeting with, I glance at my watch to see who the text is. 
inevitably I have people say, hey, do you, do you need to go? Are, are you busy? No, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm just checking to see who it was in case it was more important than, than this conversation. All of these things that are intended to be good, if they're not tended to, they'll just further the drive for hurry in our life. And I just wanna say, you can't do anything of significance in a hurry. And if you can't do anything of significance in a hurry, including growing in your relationship with God, then what does it look like if all of us begin to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives? Let, let me give you some things you can try this week, okay? I can't promise that this will help, but just try this, okay? What if this week, when you get on the interstate, if instead of pushing yourself all the way to the fast lane, all the way to the left as fast as you can, what if you drove in the slow lane on purpose, you get behind that person that can't see over the wheel, you just stay in that lane. Look, I know this is Veterans Day weekend and you feel like that feels un-American, right? People fought for my freedom, people fought for that fast lane. Look, do it to remind your soul that not everything in this life is worth the hurry. But what if this week when you go to the grocery store or Walmart or Target or wherever you go, what if you intentionally picked the longest line and you got in line on purpose? to remind your soul that not everything is a race? What if you took the farthest parking spot away from your office or from the store and you took a casual walk in to remind your soul that not everything in this life is a hurry? Okay, here, here's a weird one, okay? What if you chewed your food intentionally at least 15 to 20 times before you swallowed it? Now that seems weird, but th today at lunch, just pay attention, if you will, to how many times you chew before you swallow. Most Americans only chew four to six times their bite before they actually swallow it. And it has devastating effects on our digestive system. Why do we do that? Because we're powering through, because there's always something else to do. What if you slowed down and you just enjoyed it? Here's what I think will happen. Jesus says, therefore, do not worry. Do not be split and fractured. What will actually happen is you'll stop being split and fractured and you'll actually be in the moments of your life. You won't miss the moments of your kids. You won't blink and feel like all of a sudden they're graduating and leaving home, but instead you'll enjoy and you'll soak in all of those moments. Let me get real with you. I struggle with this maybe more than anyone in the room, but I'm willing to work at it. What would it look like if all of us just made this decision that this is the week that cold turkey, I'm gonna quit hurrying so that I can quit worrying. Would you bow your head and close your eyes all across this room? Let's pray, God, wow. This one is so much easier to talk about than it is to actually live out. God, I pray that you'll give us the courage to actually do what your word says. Help us to take Jesus' words to heart. May we not live with a constant sense of worry, which means being split and fractured, but may we be fully present. God, give us the courage to do the hard work of our souls to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our life so that we can experience you and we can experience this life. God, for those of us who have made the false assumption that life is only experienced when it's full, may we slow down and realize that it was never intended to be full, it was made to be fulfilled, fulfilling. God, give us the courage to say no to some stuff so we can enjoy the beauty that you are writing and the story of our life all around us. We thank you for that, God, in Jesus' name.